Coming up next on American Black Journal, our guest is outgoing Detroit Mayor Dave Bing. We'll talk with him about the challenges and accomplishments during his term and what advice he has for new Mayor Michael Duggan. Plus, what does he see in Detroit's future? We'll talk about all of this and more in a conversation you don't want to miss, so stay tuned. Eric wants to know, what does DTE Energy do to make Michigan a better place? Rodney can tell you. We do a lot, like youth education and employment programs. We fund over 500 jobs for youth all across the state. Many are neighborhood improvement projects just like this. It's incredible. Wow, that is fantastic. So this is like a paint by number, this whole thing, right? Communities are such great places, aren't they? They sure are. I love the siding. Measure once, cut twice, right? DTE Energy. Know your own power. When I grow up, when I grow up, when I grow up, I want to be an architectural engineer. A registered nurse. In the law enforcement. A computer scientist. A successful person. Give Michigan's children the chance to aim high with quality early education. Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. After serving as Detroit's top leader for four and a half years, Mayor Dave Bing is entering the next chapter of his life. His tenure was filled with challenges, achievements, disappointments, and progress. Coming into office, he inherited a $330 million budget deficit and $18 billion in debt and long-term liabilities. As a result, Detroit recently became the largest city in history to seek bankruptcy protection. Dave Bing joins me now to reflect on his term as mayor. So welcome back to American Black Journal. Good you know, to be here. I, I was thinking uh, this morning when I was getting ready that uh, about the first interview I did with you uh, four years ago when you when you took this job and all the things we talked about then. <laughs> uh, could, could you even have imagined then that we'd be where we are now? Uh, absolutely not. Um, you know, you go in with no transition time. Uh, you know, you don't have any data that you can look at. Um, to make informed decisions. So we had to really start from scratch, right. putting a lot of things uh, in play uh, with, with the turnaround crisis team and all the recommendations that they made, uh, which were all good recommendations, right. but because they didn't understand municipalities, city government, it's like, okay, you ought to be able to do this. Well, it doesn't work like that. Right, you right. Know? And so it takes you much, much more time to get things done in the public sector than it did in the private sector. Yeah. What, what was the biggest surprise for you when you got there? And, and we should remind the viewers, as you just did, you weren't elected in November and took office in January. We had uh, an emergency election because of the crisis with Kwame yeah. Kilpatrick. Ken Cockrell had been serving as mayor. Uh, and then you had to just step in literally days after, after yeah. the election. Yeah. Well, I think the biggest problem that I saw um, was it looked like we were going to run out of cash. Right. right. And so, um, you know, for the first 90 to 120 days, it was said you're going to have payless paydays. So from a cash flow standpoint, we didn't have a cash flow analysis done, so you never knew how much money you had or didn't have. Right. So we had to work feverishly uh, to put that in place. And then uh, you're, you're robbing Peter to pay Paul uh, so that you don't, number one, miss anybody's payday, but number two, uh, you start to move money from department to department so that they can try to get some things done in terms of services for the people. But uh, without money, uh, I don't care who <laughs> you are, how smart you are, how hard you work, you can't get things done, and right. we just didn't have the money. Right, and that's been the story for, for yeah. four years. I mean, yeah. you, we were never able to get to the point where there was enough money to do the things that you really wanted to do. You know, we cut, uh, just in staff, uh, our costs for, for staff and benefits uh, over that four years. Um, we went from 14,000 employees down to 9,200 employees, saving about $400 million. But uh, even with that, we still couldn't get our traction to go forward because we weren't getting the revenue stream that we needed uh, to make the necessary investments. So it, without the money, without making the investments, both in people and some of the systems, it, it, it became almost an impossible job. Right. Uh and so do you feel like, I mean, now we're in bankruptcy and, uh, you know, there's a whole different set of rules and a whole different set of choices that have to be made. Do you feel like if we had made that decision 
maybe in the first six months of you being mayor, would we be further along? I mean, was it was it an it was it inevitable when you took office that we would get to this point because of the revenue picture, because of the debt? No doubt, it was inevitable. But no, I mean, the reality is that when I came into office, with the numbers that you just put out, three hundred and thirty million dollars from an accumulated deficit, eighteen billion dollars in long-term debt and liabilities, we were already bankrupt. Right. So, uh, had we done, had we filed, we just hadn't filed. Had we filed for bankruptcy earlier on, there's no doubt in my mind uh, that the landscape would have changed. And I think we would have been much farther along. You know, is that something you actually considered when you got in and saw how bad things were? Never wanted to go bankrupt, you know, because, you know, it's, you don't know what you're doing. Right. You know? But that's not the case. I had a lot of outside professionals come in that were very, very capable and worked hard. But um, bankruptcy is the way to go. There's no doubt in my mind about it because now you can do things in the bankruptcy that you couldn't do uh, outside of bankruptcy. Right. Uh, you know, I, I wrote a column, uh, I think about six months ago, about uh, trying to get you actually into the race <laughs> to run again, because I was not, uh, I was not thrilled with the, the choices that we had. But in that column, I talked about a lot of the things that, that you accomplished uh, over the, the last four years that I think a lot of people have either forgotten or don't give you uh, enough credit for. And when I was sitting putting the list together, I was even a little surprised by how much was on it. What What are the things that, that for you stand out as the most important things you actually got done? Um, th there's no no doubt that, um, you know, coming in after the last administration uh, and, and very unstable situation, right. nobody trusted city government. And so, you know, you had to bring back some kind of credibility. And so that, that was difficult. You can't put a dollar number on it. But um, I think we've accomplished that. I think people, you see the city different now. Uh, people are starting to come in the city. People are investing in the city. But we've got a long ways to go. Um, you know, General Motors was ready to leave, take their headquarters out of downtown Detroit right, and I go to Warren. I right. uh, was able to convince them that that was not the best thing for them or us. Right. Uh, they stayed, increased the amount of employees that they had in the city. Blue Cross, Blue Shield moved all of their people downtown. Dan Gilbert started to move all of his people downtown. And that started to change the landscape real quick. You know, we thought Kobo was a, uh, was was going to go. Right. Um, the automotive, the um, International Automotive Show was about to pull the plug and say, if you don't fix Kobo, we're going. So we had to put that regional authority together. And a lot of people were upset about that because they're saying you're giving away an asset. Well, it's an asset that was costing our general fund $20 million a year that right. we didn't have. Right. So we had to get out of that deal. And I think now the, when people look at uh, what we're doing at Kobo, they're saying this is the benchmark in terms of authorities and what authorities ought to be doing. Right. Um, the, the toughest thing for me was the impact, the negative impact of letting so many people go. We were bloated. We could not afford them. So, um, you know, we, we trimmed the, uh, uh, the employee base uh, of about 4,000 people. Right. And I know that had a negative impact on a lot of different well, families. Well, it, it, it makes it impossible yeah. for you to actually do the things yeah. that you need to do in terms right. of service right. providing. Right. Yeah. What, about, what about the revenue picture? I mean, uh, you can talk about that in terms of tax revenues that the city, you know, should be collecting, but also there's a bigger picture in terms of what the state and what Washington do to try to help cities. Uh, you know, we all know cities are not getting a lot of help at all from Lansing uh, these days, and and Washington has got its own got its own yeah. problems. What what do you feel like the state might have been able to do that might have helped us uh, a little more earlier in your term? Well, I think they could have helped us in collecting taxes, uh, for sure. Right. They, they're doing that in a couple of different municipalities. Why they didn't do it with us, I don't know, because con consistently people were saying, you know, you got all of this revenue out there, all of these uncollected taxes. But when you go back and you look at 10, 12, 15 years of uncollected taxes, some of them are uncollectible. Right. People are no right. longer here. Right. People who no longer have jobs couldn't, couldn't afford the taxes. And so that's not a right number, but uh, from the commuter tax, uh, for those people that live in the city and work outside of the city, we needed some help because uh, our uh, IT systems are so outdated. Right. I mean, you just can't do anything in real time. The same thing would be true with people who don't live in the city but work in the city. 
And so we were never collecting those taxes, and that would have helped us immensely. The other thing is that uh, I, I think the state could have helped us a little more uh, from a revenue sharing standpoint. I know historically right. what the deal was. We weren't going to get all of that money. But I think could have, they could have come to the table and given us or helped us get some of the money sooner so that we could make investments in some of the systems uh, that needed to be upgraded. Right. You've been pretty upfront about your frustrations with Governor Snyder and the relationship uh, that between the city and the state uh, through the consent agreement through the emergency manager. Uh, but I think what Governor Snyder, in fact, wrote a piece in, uh, in my paper two weeks ago outlining all kinds of things that he feels like he's done for the city. How do you, how do you sort of uh, define that disconnect? Is he, is he doing more than you're giving him credit for? Uh, or are you, uh, is, is he shorting us uh, an awful lot? Oh, I think we're getting shorted. Um, that's not to say he hasn't done some things. He has, but it's not enough. Yeah. And so with the largest city in the state being in the kind of shape that we're in and people constantly saying how important Detroit is to the state of Michigan, then you needed to do more. Right. And so, um, and, and he's still going to have to do more, even with Kevin here right now and that relationship being what it is. If he doesn't get some money uh, from the state, some of the things that he wants to do, he's not going to be able to do. It's, uh, it's an affordability issue, and if you don't have money, you're not going to fix some of the problems. Right. So, so what are the kind of things that you would say uh, uh, Mike Duggan, who's the new mayor, should be, should be pushing for the state to invest in in Detroit? Uh, without a doubt, uh, blight is, is a key. Right. Um, and, and the state put in about $10 million over a year ago to tear down like a, a, a thousand homes. Um, a year, year and a half later, um, they may have spent about $700,000 and torn down maybe 600 homes or so. So uh, that's not their so strength. So they're not even, they're no. not even moving no. on no. that investment. No. That's not their strength, I don't think. And so now that, you know, you got a blight authority that's in play, and I think everybody in this area understands that in order to fix the city, you got to clean the city up. We've got so many dangerous empty buildings that create a, 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 a haven for crime. Right. Uh, much less, um, you know, how bad it looks. I mean, people just don't feel, how can you feel good when you've got to get up and every day you look at a burnout house across the street or sure. you see the kind of activities that are going on, you can't feel good about it. So now we're focused on cleaning the city up from a blight perspective. The state can be helpful there, I think. Um, the other areas that they need to help us with is get, getting us loosening up the purse string so there's money available to invest on the IT side. Yeah. Because right. right now, almost everything that we do is manual. It takes forever. People and, still doing stuff yeah, on pencil right. and paper. You, you, yeah. you can't continue to do that. I mean, we're woefully behind in that. So there has to be investment dollars that I think you'll get a, a, a payoff. You get a return on your investment relatively quick in some areas. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, police there. I mean, uh, that's been, uh, for my lifetime in Detroit, uh, a big issue. You had your own challenges with uh, police yep. chiefs yep. <laughs> and and the policing issue yep. and crime. But I also know that's a uh, an area that's very uh, close to your heart. I mean, you feel very passionately about the the danger that Detroiters face yep. every day. I think uh, with the changes that have occurred with the new police chief coming in. Um, one of the things that I kind of wish he had done is that as tough as it was for the prior chiefs, um, a lot of the, the statistics that we're seeing right now, a reduction in murders, a reduction in this, a reduction in that. I mean, this chief's only been here, you know, not even six it's months not yet. six months, right. So when you can do the analysis and you compare year over year, uh, some credit ought to be given to those other folks that were in play. Uh, this chief has come in and, uh, you know, he's, he seems to be a no-nonsense guy. He understands how critical this is. And he's starting to do some, some, some things. But uh, they got to get more people. Right. I mean, you know, the more officers. Yeah, you know, if you look at the consent decree that we've gone back to well, 15 years ago almost, um, it's costing us a million dollars a year. You've got 30 to 40 police officers um, that are doing administrative work. The sooner we can get from under that, you no longer have to pay that administrative fee 
and those guys could get back on the street. And right. that's, that's a big plus. So there are a lot of good things that are starting to happen in the city. But we've got this, uh, this culture of crime that I don't care where you go across the country, I've never seen anything yeah. this bad. It is different. And, yeah. I, and that's one, yeah. I, I feel like uh, a lot of people here don't quite understand that, they, that, that we've come to expect that things are just like this. But yeah. in other cities, it doesn't seem as, as pernicious. Yeah, and what we've got to do, I think, as a community, you know I mean, I think people are now understanding that policing itself will not solve that problem. Right. It's, a, it's a community issue right. that all of us got to come together and say we're not going to accept this anymore. When you see young people um, with, with uh, nice cars, uh, with a lot of money in their pocket, with all of the jewelry and all of that, and nobody questions them about it. They don't have a job. Where are they getting the, this kind of stuff? So, you know, parents and family members got to step up to the table and start right. asking those questions and not accept that as the norm. It, right. it is not the norm. Well, and we've got to deal with the poverty that people yeah. are living in in yeah. the city. I mean, it's, it's, it's so much worse now than it was 10, 15, 20 yeah. years ago, and that gives people that kind of hopelessness yeah. that leads them to to other things. Yeah, well, we prey upon each other, you know, and um, and you understand that people are just trying to survive. Right. But uh, to take advantage of now children and elderly people, it's just Which something. Which we're seeing a lot more. I know, of. and you know, that's something in our community, I meaning the black community, that you never saw before. Those right. folks were always protected. That's right. And now we've got this culture of crime where anything goes it's okay and we got to stop that and the whole snitching thing we got to get away from that look what you're doing is wrong it's unacceptable and if we find out that you're doing these things we're going to tell right right uh it's a nice transition to to what you are interested in doing post pay, post uh, being mayor uh, you've started this really remarkable effort to to, to raise money to boost recreation activities in the city. I know how important that was to you as a kid yeah. growing up in, uh, in Washington, D.C. You're trying to give the same kind of advantages to, to kids in Detroit. Yeah, you know, we've got to make sure that our kids have a safe haven to grow, uh, to play, to work, to, um, to develop. And so the recreation centers are very, very important in the city. We only have 17 left. And uh, I wanted to make sure that we could go out and raise enough money to make sure there were programs in those centers so the kids and the adults, when they went there, there was something for them to do that was progressive. Uh, we raised and got commitments of about $14 million. Um, we had a big event, uh, you know, a few nights ago, and um, we raised about $1.6 million. And all of that money is going to the Recreation Department for programming. And so, you know, we had a city that just couldn't afford to invest and upgrade the rec centers yeah. or our parks, but they're very important. So um, I knew that uh, we needed to raise this money. We've been a, we've done a pretty good job of it. And that's a it's a good model also for other things in the city. I mean, as you said, the city just doesn't have enough money to provide the kind of services <laughs> it did when I was a kid, uh, or even um, more recently. We've got to figure out ways to sort of leverage private and nonprofit dollars to, to, to help out with that, right? I mean, the, the foundations and the businesses, uh, the nonprofits have been absolutely, um, I mean, the kind of support that we've gotten from them because of the condition that the city is in is, is kind of unbelievable. Because everybody's begging and asking them to do something. Everybody's got a program, everybody's got an idea. Yeah. And uh, they stepped up and did a lot of things that they didn't have to do. And I just wanted to say to them on a consistent basis, thank you so very much. Because without their input, without their help, without their commitment, without their money, a lot of the things that we see starting to happen now would not have happened. Right. Uh, let's talk a little bit about legacy. Uh, what things do you think Dave Bing as mayor should be remembered for uh, 5, 10, 15 years from now? I think, uh, I'm not so worried about Dave Bing. I want to <laughs> talk about the administration. Okay, uh, because right. This is not just you. Right, because right. I brought a team of people together from the public, um, from the private sector, who made much less money than they could make in the, <laughs> in the private sector and didn't get abused. So right. <laughs> um, but they came to the table and really helped. So, um, you know, we, we um, I think we set the foundation 
for a lot of things for the future of our city. And once again, uh, over the next year, two years, the things that we worked on, the database that we put together, the plans that we put together now can be executed, I right. think, by Mike. And that's Mike's strength. But once again, he's not going to be able to execute without money. So right. he's still got to get money uh, to get some of these plans into uh, true execution. But I think we've, we've definitely laid a foundation that's, uh, uh, that makes our city very viable, and we got to think about growth, right. not just cutting. Not just cutting, but, right. but, but how to grow. Yeah. Uh, you know, over the four, last four years, you and I would get crosswise every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> that's always <laughs> the case, right? Exactly. And I'm sure Mike Duggan and I will go, go yeah. at it too. But it, it typically was over the pace of change, yeah. that, that, that uh, we would be frustrated that things weren't happening faster. I always sense that you had the same frustration. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that, you know, it, ultimately it was your responsibility to, to get things, but why can't things move faster here uh, than they do? Well, I, I think we've got an outdated model in city government. I mean, there are so many uh, roadblocks and red flags that you've got to touch base on and get the approval for this, get the approval for that, it takes forever. Yeah. And once again, because the systems are so outdated and things are done manually, that slows the pace down, plus the fact it, it opens up uh, all kinds of avenues for errors, human error. Sure. And then you got to go back and start from square and one and start, all all, and start all over yeah. again. And, and I, I think with the emergency manager in place, having the kind of authority that he has right now, he can bypass a lot of that. And I think Kevin will do that, and I think he'll give Mike support. That's going to be very important to get things done. Yeah. Uh, is there anything that you wish just that you had done either early or late that you think would have uh, changed the, the, the trajectory of things uh, dramatically? I mean, any, any regrets about uh, missed opportunities? I think, um, I, I think the city council president, uh, the former city council president, uh -huh. Um, had a different agenda and and you know I, I think he wanted a political career yeah. and he just constantly pushed back and fought on everything and um, you know I, I think we came to the table with a lot of good ideas a lot of fresh ideas but it was always this pushback and I couldn't spend a lot of my time <laughs> trying to develop nine relationships with, with the city yeah. very tough because the, here you got the city burning down you know so to speak and so you're trying to get things done. So when you have to go and you gotta develop all of these relationships and, and get people to trust you for what it is you're trying to do, it takes way too much time. So that slowed the process down quite a bit. But if I look back now retrospectively, um, I wish the relationships uh, with city council had been better. Yeah. And, yeah. and you know, I take some responsibility for that, but so do they. I think every mayor that I've ever talked to would, would, would say the same thing. Yeah. Is that is that about personalities or is that about the model? Yeah, it's the model. It's the model. Yeah, it's the model. And we gotta we gotta think through that. I mean, here is an opportunity where Detroit is today to make substantive changes. Right. Um, when you look at the charter, you know, I think the charter, the change in the charter went too far because they tried to protect everything that had happened in the Kilpatrick sure. administration. Yeah. So that slows you down in a lot of cases. I mean, you know, I'm not opposed to the legislative body uh, having information in a timely fashion, but once again, it was hard to give them information because, because of the system problems. Right. You know, you, right. you, it took you forever to get all of the information you needed to get it to them in a timely fashion so they could look at it and make a determination which way to go. So uh, some of those things need to, uh, we, we need to blow those out <laughs> of the water. Right. And, and start uh, over. Yeah, right? and start over, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, we've got about a minute left. Where are we going to see you in six months? On a beach, <laughs> in an office somewhere, still working uh -huh. in the city? What are you planning well, to do? I'm not going anywhere. Uh, Detroit's been my home for 47 years, yeah. all of my adult life. Uh, I love the city and its people. Right now, I want to concentrate on some of our uh, young males that are in yeah. trouble. So right. I want to go into the school system and be able to help Jack Martin. Uh, who's a good friend of mine yeah, and I know well, was in your administration. CFO yeah. and, and they need some help so I want to go into middle schools and if he wants me to go in high schools I'd like to go in and start talking to these young guys about their preparation for life because uh, too many of them you know got the wrong kind of ideas sure. and everybody wants to get rich quick doesn't yeah. happen <laughs> that doesn't work doesn't I mean, happen. <laughs> your life is a great example yeah. it's, it's a marathon not a sprint correct right? correct yeah. well 
Good luck. Well, and, thank you. Uh, uh, the city owes you, of course, yeah. all kinds of gratitude. Yeah. So. Well, thank you, Steve. Yeah. Thank you. That's our show for today. Thanks for watching, and we'd love to hear what you thought about today's program and get your ideas for future topics. So connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We'll see you next time on American Black Journal. What does DTE Energy do to make Michigan a better place? Rodney can tell you. We do a lot, like youth education and employment programs. We fund over 500 jobs for youth all across the state. Many are neighborhood improvement projects just like this. It's incredible. Wow, that is fantastic. So this is like a paint by number, this whole thing, right? Communities are such great places, aren't they? They sure are. I love the siding. Measure once, cut twice, right? DTE Energy, know your own power. When I grow up, when I grow up, when I grow up, I want to be an architectural engineer. A registered nurse. In the law enforcement. A computer scientist. A successful person. Give Michigan's children the chance to aim high with quality early education.